Joining me this week as elders holding care of meeting of worship are Jan Hoffman, Ann Dodd Collins, Allison Randall, Minga Claggett Bourne, Rua Swenerfeld, and Wendy Schlatterbeck. With Jay as his elders are Susan Davies, LVM Shelton, Anna Lindo, and Charlie Gorham. I have been arrested and am now awaiting trial. In one sense, it's all because of Jay O'Hara. In 2013, he made national news in a lobster boat, intentionally blocking the delivery path of a 14,000 ton coal barge. That was a courageous but illegal act for which he was arrested. Last month, Jay was on trial for another offense involving coal. This time, the crime was littering of coal at the New Hampshire State House. I assure you that he's not our Bible presenter because he's broken the law. And relax, it's quite unlikely that this morning he'll try to persuade you to be lawbreakers. As part of the climate disobedience team, I have witnessed firsthand Jay's calmness, his patience, and his solidly nonviolent attitude. He led us but not with agitation and excitement. He used calmness, rootedness, and love, asking us to connect within ourselves to the source. It is this clarity that Jay exhibits, this connection to his core being, that's the reason for his presence with us this morning. I have no idea what he's going to say today or for the next four mornings. My expectation is that his words will assist us in connecting to the primal energy source, the one that every Quaker recognizes, that of God within each of us. Friends, Jay will speak out of the silence. Good morning, friends. So grateful for you all being here this morning. Um, like Carol, I also don't entirely know what I'm going to be saying this morning or for the next four days. And I ask each of you to, in whatever way you do, to hold me and us in prayer that we may each find that place within us that guides us to rightness and relationship and patience and endurance. So, I think by way of introduction to start uh, today and to start this week off, um, today, today I'm hopeful that we'll get into a bit of framing that will set us up for the rest of the week together. Um, and, and to do that, I wanted to start off with a little bit about my condition and where, where I've been these last few months in preparing for, for these talks. Um, I stand before you uh, with a bit of uh, no small amount of trepidation as um, many Bible half hour speakers before that I've heard have been uh, either practice pastors or um, in some way, if not professional, at least um, amateur biblical scholars in some way. Um, I am none of those things. And had I been asked maybe a year ago to give, give a set of Bible half hours, you probably would have gotten, um, we'll call him Sanctimonious Jay. <laughs> Um, Jay that is quite sure of himself and clear about what he needs to say and clear about how he needs to be. But I come before you this year not filled exactly with energy and clarity, 
and vigor in that same way, but with doubt, which I think is good. Because when there is doubt, there can also be faith. Instead of the rush of assurance that I, that I have, uh, or that I often have, that what I'm offering is right and good and is supposed to be, I am here before you having to take that on faith. Much of the time over the last few months, I have not felt that guiding hand close to me. So it's probably appropriate for me to be doing Bible half hours at this time. Because for me, that's part of the process. That having some assurance when the fire isn't kindled and raging inside of me, what the path is supposed to be. And that's not to say that some of what, or much of what I have to share, I have too many double negatives. Um, that's, not to, that's, to say, that's not to say that much of what I have to share hasn't been tested experientially. I think it has. But that for me, when things are down and clouded and dreary, um, it's helpful to have somewhere to turn. Ideally, um, well, to turn one, one place is to turn, and that, that brings us here today, is to scripture. Um, and we'll be doing some investigating of that together over the next five days. But it's also helpful to me to be able to turn to my Quaker community in these times a place that could be a place of solace and comfort, guidance and assurance. And while I found that there are individual friends who provide that for me, by and large, I find that messages in worship and the content of most of our shared life together as friends doesn't do that for me. I remember at some point, I don't know if it was uh, Noah Baker Merrill or Khaled Keith Perry talking about kind of three pillars of discernment, the inward light, the Holy Spirit, the guide, scripture, and the community. The idea of that being, being that in discerning new revelation, we need two of these to be in harmony, uh, to to maybe buck or go counter to the other. But when my inward light goes dim, I need more than scripture to comfort me. I hunger for a community with a shared conception of who we are and where we're going and a shared vision of what the Quaker path is so that when the light goes out for some of us, there are those who still have vision and light and are able to keep leading us on. So it's my intention and hope in these Bible half hours <clears throat> to provide humbly some framing about what that community, what that religious society of friends in the liberal tradition might look like to achieve that. But I pray that this vision isn't just, wouldn't just be a help for me in hard times. But I believe also that we as a people, as a religious society of friends, have some prophetic vocation to play in these times that such a clarity of path and direction and vision might enliven and make vital a religious society of friends 
that may contribute to precisely the type of healing that our world needs. But we're going to need to ourselves have to transform and heal and change. Maybe not before we go out to do that, but as we go out to do that. Heal, transform, and, cha and, and change within ourselves as individuals, within our meetings as communities, and in going out into the world. This isn't a prophetic vocation of telling the rest of the world how they're messing it up or how we've got it right. It's about us showing a way forward, doing our own work and walking a path that is discernibly different than the path of say upper middle class white educated liberalism. So what does this have to do with the Bible? Thanks for asking. <laughs> One of the reasons I keep coming back to the Bible through my work um, in what has been primarily around trying to deal with climate change is a clarity that if we keep rushing around hurriedly trying to fix things and not take the time to really step back, we won't get deep enough down to the root of our illnesses. And then if we're only trying to alleviate the symptoms of the problem, then we're not in the end going to either be successful or transformed in the way that we need to be transformed. That's not to say that alleviating symptoms is unimportant. But in order to address the ills of the world adequately, we need to address and heal the ways that those maladies show up in and permeate our religious society. And we need to identify the ways that they show up and permeate each of us individually. I need to identify and change the way the empire shows up in me. It shows up within our religious society and within ourselves when the prerogatives and privileges of whiteness and the cultural markers that delineate and maintain white supremacy, set or manage the agenda, build or disrupt relationships, empower or disempower individuals or their approach and ministry. It shows up when settler colonialism and the taking and superiority and hierarchy and cisgendered hetero, hetero, hetero patriarchy mold and shape us rather than allowing God to shape us. Lisa Graustein, a couple years ago in her plenary, called this force that moves in the structures of ourselves and of nations uh, as empire. I also like to call it the domination system, a term that I found through the writings of Walter Wink. The domination system in some is the ranking of some humans over and above others and the rest of creation and the ordering of our society in lives 
around that ranking and ordering of some things above and better and superior and other things below. I believe it is or could be, if we respond to the call, the vocation of this religious society of friends to upend and counter that domination system, again, within ourselves, within our meetings, and in society at large. These three realms that can never be pulled apart. So the journey I want to take with you this week is a journey as far as I've been taken or as far as I have seen into what that path is or may be dimly lit as I can see it. And for me, this is where the Bible comes in. As I read it, the Bible is an attempt to record the stories where God and spirit and light and life attempt to break in and disrupt that domination system over and over again. And that in the Bible, in its stories and in Quaker history, we find that, erup the, that eruption of the Holy Spirit and freshness that creates new life and new relationships among people, both to themselves, to, their, to each other and to the world around them. And at the same time, in both the Bible and in Quaker history, I find stories of that domination system co-opting and domesticating the symbols and power of these mov movements and motions of God among us. So just one example. In Genesis chapters one and two and three, we find two different creation stories. One, a creation story of a God from above that creates all things in an ordered number of days and in an ordered number of progressions. And then at the end says, and you shall either have dominion or rule or et cetera, et cetera, over all the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and the livestock and the wild animals and the creatures that move along the ground. And then there is another creation story that follows of Adam and Eve who lived in and among the, the ecology in relationship of that first garden of Eden. Did not rule over it, but were a part of it. And we're asked only to refrain from eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of right and wrong, good and evil. To refrain from pretending that they could decide or we could decide who should live and die and to refrain from the knowledge or the expectation that they should rule over all. Now, the story of how that then happened is like, has some convoluted gender stuff going on in there. Um, and I'm not gonna pretend that it's not complicated and there's not problematic things in there. 
But what I read is an invitation for us to re-engage in relationship to one another in which we are not ashamed to be our full selves naked before one another. And in relationship, equal relationship with all of the rest of creation. Indeed, George Fox testified that he had come to a spiritual state in which he had gone through the flaming sword that guarded the gates of the garden after Adam and Eve were kicked out. In this age for me, <laughs> as a white man, as I have watched the news over the past, well, it's decade, but just to think of the last few years with white men carrying torches marching in Charlottesville, with people storming the United States Capitol this winter, many of whom carry a story that this book <laughs> is their book. I have some hope, friends, that we not just might be able to, but that some way in my redemption here is to find a way to reclaim the stories in this book from the apologists and foot soldiers of the empire and to be able to trace back in my spiritual lineage through this book, the thread of liberation of the God of freedom where the Holy Spirit erupts unexpectedly and acts to transform history. So this week, I hope we together will explore that counter story and to tease out some of that thread in this book and ask how might we orient our religious society of friends around doing that and proclaiming the good news that there is something other than the empire to put our faith and our trust and our hope in. And explore maybe also what it might look like in our witness out in the world and what it might look like in our economic lives together. Um, We're on Zoom, so there's, or many of us are on Zoom. I'm also grateful for friends who are here at Portland Friends Meeting. Um, with that uh, digital dimension, I wanna invite friends to bring with them a Bible, like a physical one, you know, so we can hold and have a, have a tactile experience together, even if it's mediated uh, across, across the digital divide. And I hope that we'll get to spend some time in meditation on, on some of the things in here together and reading together. So to start that off, if you have a Bible near you or if you have one in the room uh, next to you, 30 second break to go grab it. <laughs> They're all in the library. <laughs> okay. 
and um, and open up to I invite you to join me in opening to Psalm 143. And I'm going to close today by reading verse one through eight out loud, and then we'll enter into a half hour of waiting worship together. I'm going to wait for my friends in this room to come back with the Bibles from the library, hopefully. Oh, victory. Psalm 143. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. The enemy the internal enemies, pursue me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. I thirst for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. For I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. 